You know what the single most important thing on your lathe to protect is? The spindle nose. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back to working on building a die filer today and we're going to do a bunch more operations on that big tricky base casting. Should be pretty cool, so let's go. I'm going to start with a slight diversion today. I got some mail here from a viewer. This die filer kit does not come with a motor, it's BYOM as these kits generally are. But one of my patrons who watched one of my behind the scenes videos on this project said, hey, I got a bunch of motors. Do you want one? And I was like, heck yeah, I do. So we talked about it and we agreed this would be the right one. And he sent it to me. This is a really cool kind of vintage looking thing. It's a quarter horsepower, 1725 RPM, single phase. Should be just perfect for my little die filer. Now the bearings in this thing don't sound great and there is a suspicious amount of end float in that. So I think we're gonna have to rebuild it, but that's okay. Motors are expensive and I'm super grateful to have this one. We can fix it. That's a future coin problem though. Let's get back to the main casting here today. I'm gonna to tackle the main bore here that runs right down the center of the nose there. That's where the drive shaft from the motor goes through. It's a very important bore on this thing and it might be the trickiest feature here on this casting. I've decided to try this on the lathe with a cross slide setup similar to the line boring operation that I did on my big steam engine. The bore on this casting is not big enough to do a line bore though. I think the line boring tool would end up too thin and not rigid enough for that. So it's going to be a traditional bore, but I am going to fixture on the cross slide here. The obvious way to set this up would be thusly, since there's bolt holes in the base that we might be able to use to fixture. Unfortunately, that puts the nose on the casting much, much too high for the spindle nose on my lathe. So that is not going to work. Instead, we're going to have to do this upside down which should be fine because we've faced the top of that boss parallel to the base, so this is just as good a reference. Now it's just a question of getting it lifted up to the correct height here. A one, two, three block was too much. So what I'm doing is just trying some stacks of parallels here to get the nose of the casting in the ballpark to be at the same height as the nose on my lathe. Once we get this close, then we can start dialing it in and fine tuning. This looks like it'll be close, so now I can start setting up the fixturing. When I line board the frame on that big steam engine, I put together a set of fixturing tools, if you like, for my cross slide. I made T-nuts and I made these bars here that allow me to position the work wherever I need to. And this is gonna be just the thing here as well. So with my parallel stack in there and my bars bolted in place, what I can do is use the threaded holes in the bars to attach the casting upside down using long pieces of threaded rod all the way down. I can always add holes to these bars here if I need to, but the ones that are there from the previous time I used them should work just as well here as well. But then as though the entire universe were conspiring to irritate me after all this work to get this set up, those cast bosses there are about a quarter of an inch too long to clear the threaded rod. So we need to face those bosses down anyway and looking at the drawing, once they're faced, they should clear that threaded rod. So let's just go ahead and do that now. In fact, this was of course my plan all along. I was just showing you that other setup to explain why I'm doing it this way. What? You're looking at me like you don't believe me. I can prove this was my plan. Because shut up, that's why. I think this will be easy to do on the mill so I don't have to disrupt my cross slide setup and I'm gonna do my best to get it aligned to the Y axis on the mill here. Of course, it's a casting so we don't have a lot of references but I know from other work on this casting that these sides of it here are actually pretty straight. So I can indicate these in, and that should get the casting overall straight to the mill. Once I've faced these bosses, I'll have a reference for this axis on the casting, and I'll be able to use these bosses from now on for that reference. I checked in a few places here all over the casting as well, just to make sure I was kind of on average pretty straight, and this is all looking quite good. I'm within a couple of thousands for the most part everywhere I check. Next, I need to get the mill spindle on the center line of the part here. To do that, I'm going to indicate in the bore there that we previously did on this part. And I'm going to use my indicator holder here. This is a shop-made indicator holder. I have a video on this if you're interested. 
Once I've got the spindle zeroed on this bore, then I know that we're on the center line of the casting in both axes, and since we've straightened the casting on the y-axis, I know I'll be able to mill those side bosses down to width relative to this center line, and the resulting surfaces will be parallel to the center line of the part on this axis. The drawing specifies the distance from surface to surface across these bosses, so I translate out half that distance on my DRO, plus the radius of this cutter, and you can see where I'm going to land. So obviously I have quite a bit to remove there. So I set an incremental zero at this position, then I translate out to where I can touch off, and I mill down to zero on the incremental scale on my DRO. This technique is an easy way to hit a specific value on your DRO to create the surface at the position that you need, while still having the freedom to manage your depth of cut however you need to. That's especially important on small milling machines where you usually can't take the cut that you need to in a single pass. With one boss complete, and I'm happy with the finish on that, I can now run around the back and translate to positive half that distance that we just machined to on this side. And once again, you can see that we've got quite a bit of material to remove, so I set my incremental zero on that position again, and once again, mill down to zero. Okay, let's see how we did here. This dimension is not super critical, so I'm expecting to nail it, because of course that's generally what happens for the ones that don't matter. And survey says, yep, to the tenth, four zero zero zero. Maybe I just need to trick myself into thinking all the dimensions are unimportant, and then maybe I'll nail them all like this? Is that the secret to being a good machinist? Maybe. Cast iron is very messy, but I will say it is also very satisfying to clean up. It vacuums up incredibly well, partly because it's all dry. I'm machining all of this cast iron dry, as is typical practice, because cast iron is self-lubricating for the most part. It releases loose graphite as you machine it, so you don't generally need any kind of cutting fluid or coolant for it. At this point I realized while I'm here, I might as well do the volt circle that is needed at the top of this because I'm already centered up on the bore there. This was a good excuse to try out the bolt circle function on the new DRO that came with this mill. I have not dug into some of the more advanced features on it yet. I do like this full screen interface for entering all the parameters. Certainly more convenient than fishing through the LED display menus of the previous DRO that felt very much like programming a VCR. Oh, uh, I guess if you're under 30, a VCR was a thing that played movies very, very badly, but we were grateful for it because it played movies. I had said in my unboxing video of this new mill that I didn't love this DRO, but I gotta say, it's starting to grow on me. I'm giving it a chance, and graphical displays like this one where it shows your bolt circle and where the spindle is on it, it's pretty cool. And the Touch DRO does stuff like this also, but eh, this one has the advantage of already being installed. I've long said that DROs are arguably essential on milling machines these days, and bolt circle functions are one of those reasons. There are, of course, many traditional ways to lay out a bolt circle, but this is one of those operations where the DRO is really transformative. Not just because it saves you having to calculate all the positions and worrying about backlash as you move from one to the next, but also because, as you see here, it allows you to do as many laps of the bolt circle as you want without losing any accuracy. And that's really nice because it means you can run around with your center drill, and then run around with your tap drill, and then run around with your tap, and everything's going to land perfectly. And that really saves you a lot of time because it allows you to optimize tool changes. If you're doing this by hand, you probably want to do all the operations for each hole as you go around in order to maintain accuracy, in order to ensure that each operation is correctly centered on the exact same spot for each hole. But then you spend a lot of time changing tools, and on some mills you spend a lot of time cranking the head or the knee up and down to make room for all the different tools. Interestingly, the drawing does not actually specify the depths for these holes. That's the kind of detail where kits and drawings that you acquire from various sources vary a lot in quality and level of detail. In this case, I take it to mean that the depths don't matter very much, but since the drawings are one-to-one, -one, I just measured what the drawing showed and I tapped them to that depth. And I also went in with a bottoming tap on each hole, another lap on the DRO, because I pretty much always bottom tap blind holes. I've never regretted doing that, and I've often regretted not doing it when you just need that one more thread to get your bolts tight. I couldn't think of any other operations to do from that setup, so now I can go back and get on track with what I was trying to do in this video, which is to bore out the main drive shaft hole here. Once again, this order of operations was completely intentional. I just, I just really can't stress that enough. So back upside down, and look at that. Now my threaded rod passes right past those bosses, just like the drawings said they should, 
and I can get back to my original plan for fixturing this thing. One concern I had about this setup is whether tightening those nuts down at the outside edges of that base like that might tend to deflect the base. So I was being careful to tighten them down evenly and gently just to see if I could detect any flexing in the casting there, but I really couldn't. It seemed fine. If it had been a concern, I could have put some machinist jacks and some blocks underneath the edges to hold the casting square, but it didn't seem to be necessary. There's lots of meat there on that cast iron. The next job is to get the nose on that casting aligned with the spindle for realsies, not just by eye like we did before. So for that I'm going to bust out the coaxial indicator. You can of course use a DTI on an arm just like we did on the mill for this, but on the lathe the coaxial is a lot easier because you don't have to try and see the indicator upside down and other such shenanigans. So I'll get this thing adjusted so that we should get a reading on it all the way around. Now normally with a coaxial indicator you spin it up slowly and then you adjust the hand wheels in real time until you get the needle to stop moving. It's kind of the secret sauce of these things and it's what makes dialing something in so quick with it. However with a casting this rough and this misshapen it just doesn't work. There's too much erratic movement on the indicator and you can't really see what you're doing. So instead you can use it another way. You can move it by hand and just sample the part at different positions. So I can check the far side, and that reads 10. Then I can check the near side, and that also reads 10. I've moved the cross slide back and forth to get those values to read the same. Then I can check the bottom and top and see how far off of 10 those are. When the part is concentric, the indicator should read the same value in all four positions. And I can see that my bottom is a little bit high here, and I can pull down a bit on the needle, and that shows me how much of my packing I need to remove. So I did a couple of rounds of removing parallels and replacing them with shim stock of different thicknesses to get down to where the indicator says I should be. It's important to note that between each of these setup changes I have to get the casting aligned again with the spindle axis of the lathe. If I don't I'm not getting a proper concentricity measurement on the nose and then of course I can't do the boring unless the casting is straight. To do that I'm clamping a parallel to one of those machined bosses that we just did and I'm using this as my square reference here for the part. The secret here is that I've got the indicator preloaded as little as possible to get a reading there because then the spring pressure is less and thus it's not deflecting that parallel which is sticking out pretty far in space there. You got to be careful about that kind of thing. In general it's a good idea to preload your indicators as little as you can to get a reading because the more you preload the indicator the more stress you're putting on the Noga arm and every other part of the setup and you can get distorted readings if parts or if the arm itself are deflecting. That parallel though is nice because it gives me a nice long reference surface here so that I can get an accurate measurement of the angle of the part and tappy tap tap it nice and straight as you can see there. I'm within a thousandth of straight. So now I can go back to checking concentricity to see what the latest change to my packing has done. I have to realign it on X of course because I've moved the casting to get the new shims under it, but luckily I know where center is. I know it's on the tens on my indicator there, so it's easy to get it centered on that position with the cross slide. And then I once again check how I'm doing on my height. Unfortunately, as has been the story with this casting, it's a little lumpy and a little crooked. So here's the best I was able to do. I've got the 10 reading on this position, which is correct. And then I've got 10 position on the bottom, which is correct. And then I've got that 10 reading on the far side as well. So everything seems to be centered, except when I go around to the top, you can see it's way off there all of a sudden. I've got a huge high spot there. So it's basically centered except for that one spot on the top. It's kind of a toss up whether you should try to split the difference vertically on that or whether you're going to make it worse doing that. It's a bit of a judgment call here and you just got to do the best you can with centering things on castings like this. But I'm happy with that. Funny thing, it actually occurred to me while I was editing this video that I could have probably just brought the casting up to the spindle nose on my lathe and lined it up by eye that way, much like you would a gauge pin on a cast boss that you're trying to drill in the center of. This just didn't occur to me because the kismet of the nose on that casting being very close to the diameter of the chuck registration on my lathe just never happens. But hey, if you get this lucky, keep that in mind. To do this boring, I'm going to use my boring head, and you may or may not know this, but the shafts can be removed from boring heads. So I take off the R8 shank that goes in the mill normally, and I replace it with this straight shank one. The straight shanked ones can be purchased on eBay or whatnot. These boring heads all seem to have a couple of standard threads in them, so it's pretty easy to find one that'll fit yours. And I'm going to mount it up in my collet chuck here. I need a long boring bar to get all the way through the nose on that casting. So this whole setup here is pretty long. It may not be rigid enough to do this operation, but 
I'm going to give it a shot. I'll start by touching off on the casting here by hand. Then I can add some depth of cut, tighten down the gib on the boring head, and away we go. This is going to be a very interrupted cut for quite a while because there's a lot of foundry scale inside there that I frankly should have sanded out first. And the core is not very centered here. So we're going to be cutting a lot on one side for a while. And that boring bar is going to take a bit of a pounding on the foundry scale. But this is actually a really good use case for brazed carbide as I happen to be using here. Brazed carbide is much better at interrupted cuts than carbide inserts are. And the carbide can handle the foundry scale much better than high speed steel could. If I was doing this with high speed steel, I'd probably be resharpening that tool six or seven times during this operation. But the carbide, I didn't have to touch it. And being brazed carbide, it never chipped. All that said, it was not cutting super well because this setup just really isn't rigid enough. So I changed my cutter setup here. I took the shank off and mounted the body of the boring head directly in my fore jaw. I dialed in the black part of the head there, the central part, so that it's running reasonably true. It doesn't matter a whole lot. All that really matters is the radius that the cutter is describing, but the lathe will run smoother if that head is running true. Then I dialed in some depth of cut here. This next part gets very screechy, so I went ahead and switched the lathe over to Ocean Sounds for your benefit. This is a long boring bar, and they do have a tendency to sing under heavy cuts like this. Sometimes that means you're getting chatter, but not always. Sometimes the boring bar just sings, but the surface finish is still good, and that's what was happening here. So I put in the earplugs and let it ride. This setup ended up working really well. I was getting excellent surface finishes in there. The boring bar was cutting really well. And what I love about this setup is that we've basically turned the lathe into a mini horizontal boring mill, which was the perfect tool for this job. On a cut like this with a long boring bar, you're getting a lot of deflection on that bar. So one thing I do is I stop and I check my measurements a lot as I'm going. With a reasonably heavy cut like this, the bar is probably deflecting at least five or six thousandths. And so the cut is lighter than you think it is. A good way to manage that is to do all of your passes and all of your measuring under the same conditions. So always do a spring pass before you measure or never do a spring pass before you measure. I was doing the latter in this case, but bear in mind that as you pull the cutter back through the work, it is going to score up the surface. So on my final pass, I make sure to move the bar clear of the work before retracting it because I know it's going to scratch that surface because of that deflection. You can also do spring passes, but you got to be a little careful with carbide and spring passes because they do tend to chatter if you try to take a really light cut on a boring bar like this. Now, I have been burned by that where you get all the way to the end of an elaborate cut like that and you do one final spring pass to clean it up and it chatters and you ruin the surface. It's not fun. And with all that said, I did blow the dimension on this by a thou and a half, but that's all right. It's still well within tolerance on this. So the only thing hurt is my pride. Now we also need to face the front surface of that nose there, and I'd like to do it in this same setup if I can, because that will guarantee squareness. So here's a way that might work for that. I'm going to put my TriFly face mill in the spindle. This is a Shrum Solutions tool. It's basically a three insert face mill. You saw me use it earlier in this same project. And the reason I think this is going to work is because the cutter is a larger diameter than the nose on that casting is. What that means is I can do a single axis milling operation. I don't have to have some kind of vertical milling contraption for my lathe. I can simply move back and forth with the cross slide and face the entire surface. The one catch here is that I don't have enough travel on my cross slide to get the work completely clear of the cutter on both sides. However, if the cutter is a larger diameter than the work, you can cheat by stopping when the work is centered on the cutter. You can hear when you're in that eye of the storm, as it were, because you can hear it stop cutting. Then just pull away from the work so that you don't drag half the inserts across the back half of it and mark up the surface. You can see a microcosm here of that effect. The cutter is making a mark on the face there, but that's okay because this is not my final cut. Measuring that surface is a little tricky. The drawing gives a dimension from the center of the part to that surface. So to get a reasonable measurement on that, I've got a drill that's a snug fit in that bore. I don't have a gauge pin for that size, but I do have this drill which fits snugly. And I'm measuring from a parallel held on that nose there. I just have to then subtract the thickness of the parallel and the radius of that drill, and that's a pretty accurate measurement. Again, the tolerances on all these surfaces are very generous, so there's no real worry here. And this method of measuring is certainly accurate enough for what we need. Once again, on that finishing cut, I pull away from the cutter once I'm on center so that I don't mar up the surface by dragging the cutters across it. 
and I got a really nice finish there. That's looking really good. The reason those cutters would mark up the surface, if you're wondering, is because there's always going to be some deflection in a setup like this. That casting is sticking out really far, and the cutter is sticking out pretty far, and so on. Anytime you've got deflection in the work or the cutter, then when you move that cutter back across, that deflection is going to be less, and the cutter is going to contact the work again, which you may not want. Back to the bench now for yield tradition of deburring. Gotta get all the sharp edges off from those operations. Gotta say I'm pretty pleased with how that boring went. It was a tricky operation. The centering is, well, not perfect. I probably could have done better with that. Maybe I should have split the difference more on the vertical, but there's going to be a pulley covering that anyway, so that'll just be our little secret. You, me, and 170,000 of my closest friends. Plus, since I do the editing around here, I can just quickly jump cut to a more flattering angle on the part for my wrap-up, in which I say, this is all the time I have for you this week, and I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank my patrons for making all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.